Hi, welcome back to biochemistry and physical chemistry and spectroscopy in what, depending on what, in which context you're watching this video. My name is Kevin Tolkoff. Make sure to like this video and subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications. So one of the things we can do in biochemistry that deals with UV vis spectroscopy is we can actually use uh, mainly three, but the third one is a minor extent, two main amino acid residues and proteins to actually quantify how much of a protein is in a sample. Now, one of the things that's really important about this method that we're going to use is there's one assumption we're going to make that you need to do is that in general, if, you're, if, you want to get a, if you want to get an accurate number for how much of a protein is in there, you need to have only that one protein in there. You can't have contamination from other proteins because you'll get a false reading. But it can tell you if you're not concerned about the identity, you just want to know the total protein of all the proteins, and you, you could certainly use this method, but if you're actually wanting to quantify a specific protein, uh, it needs to be pretty pure, okay? So proteins have um, amino acids. They're made of amino acids. And in terms of the amino acids, there's three that are what we call aromatic amino acids, okay? Those are tryptophan on top, in the middle is tyrosine, and the bottom is phenylalanine, okay? And it turns out that, like we've been talking about in uv -vis, um, applications, is that when you have conjugation of pi bonds, and also aromaticity and or aromaticity, you tend to have um, absorbance in the uv vis region, okay? And right here, this is an absorbance or absorption spectra for these three amino acids. So the red is tryptophan, blue is tyrosine, black is phenylalanine. Um, and generally what we're gonna be doing is we're gonna be, we're gonna be measuring the absorbance at 280 nanometers, which is right here. Now notice, um, if you look, this curve, which represents the overall absorption at a particular wavelength, <coughs> you'll notice at 280 nanometers, tryptophan is pretty strong, very strong. Tyrosine is relatively strong compared to that. Notice that phenylalanine's uh, curve doesn't even really touch 280. It actually does, but notice this graph starts at 10. If you actually go a little below 10, it'll actually sort of curve over very slightly, and it'll actually be a little bit of absorbance at 280. However, we more or less say that phenylalanine absorption at 280 is pretty negligible, right? Pretty negligible. So in general, when we're talking about this, we're really talking about tryptophan and tyrosine. Those are the main ones. And you'll notice, hopefully, that tyrosine actually absorbs at this wavelength a lot less than tryptophan does. Tryptophan, by far, has the most absorbance at 280 nanometers. So if you know that you're dealing with a protein that has tryptophan and tyrosine, then you could potentially quantify it by measuring the absorbance at 280. Because the protein has tryptophan and tyrosine, it's actually going to directly measure the absorbance by these two amino acid residues. And then you'll basically be able to determine the amount of protein in the sample, ultimately by using the Beer-Lambert law, or sometimes Beer's law. So when you're doing this method, it's called an A280 assay. The reason it's A280 is you're measuring absorbance at 280 nanometers. So generally what you're going to do is you're going to have potentially, let's say you have, you have a stock solution. Okay, you have a stock solution of your protein, of your enzyme. So I have my enzyme in here. This is my enzyme or protein, whatever I'm dealing with. And ultimately what I'm going to do is I'm going to make dilutions. Okay, so maybe what I'm going to do is, and if you need review on dilutions, we have videos on that. Maybe I'll make a, let's do a 1 to 5 dilution of this. I'll have another one that's a 1 to 10 dilution, maybe a 1 to 20 dilution, 1 to 50 dilution, 1 to 100 dilution, and so forth. So maybe in this I get five different solutions, all of varying concentrations. Of course, it depends on the stock uh, protein concentration, but it's going to be a 1 to 5 dilution of that, 1 to 10, and so forth, all the way to 1 in 100. Well, what I'm going to do... And we've already talked about UV vis spectroscopy, but when you put your sample in the machine, you have to put it in that cuvette, right? You put it in the cuvette, you know, you have your cuvette, you stick your diluted protein sample in here, and there's a light source, right? The light source is going to shine light on the sample. Some of it gets transmitted through, and some of it is absorbed specifically by tryptophan and tyrosine. And you do have to make sure the machine is set to 280 nanometers. Well, it's going to detect the absorbance for these varying concentrations of the stock protein solution, right? These dilutions of it. When you plot the concentration and the absorbance that it, that it gives, so each of these is going to have a corresponding absorbance, right? 
when you plot all of those, absorbance at 280 versus concentration, you actually get a straight line, relatively straight line. So maybe you have some data like this, right? Those are your five points, and you get a straight line, and that straight line is actually in the form, because it is a straight line, of y equals mx plus b. But remember, the y-axis is absorbance, so this y is going to correspond to the absorbance value. I already have arrows there. I didn't even notice that for whatever reason. <laughs> Anyways, um, let me actually redo that. M, which is the slope, in terms of Beer's Law, we've talked about how the slope of a Beer's Law plot is actually epsilon, the extinction coefficient, times the path length of the cuvette. And generally, for all cuvettes you're going to deal with, the path length is one centimeter even, 1.0 exactly. The extinction coefficient can be determined ultimately from the slope of this line. So let's suppose for a minute when you run this and you get the curve, let's suppose experimentally your slope, m, let's suppose that it was equal to 18,000. Okay? Then your extinction coefficient for this molecule would have to be 18,000, and the units are usually going to be, um, let's, say, let's say for instance your concentration of the protein was molar. Right? Just say whatever, it's molar then the units of the extinction coefficient are going to be inverse molar times inverse centimeters. Okay? If your concentration had been instead in milligrams per mil, which it very commonly is, then your extinction coefficient would be basically some number, and the units would be milliliters per milligram and then times inverse centimeters. Okay, the key with Beer's Law, there's a very common sort of rule of thumb, is that for concentration, the units in are the units out. And by out, we mean the units of the extinction coefficient. So whatever the units are here, molar, one of the units has to be inverse molar. If the units of concentration are milligrams per mil, then it has to be milliliters per milligram. Okay, that's just sort of the rule. All right, also back to the uh, y equals mx plus b, the x corresponds to a concentration and the y-intercept is just the y-intercept, okay? So let's make this pretty easy. Let's suppose that for this plot, you get y, or a, is equal to, for let's say the slope of the line is, let's say it's 10, and then you have times x, which is just c, concentration, plus a y-intercept, let's just say, I don't know, let's say 0.1, okay? So this right here, this is your Beer's Law plot. Um, if you had done this on Excel, it would have spit it out as y equals 10x plus 0.1. Remember, y is absorbance and x is concentration. So why is this useful? Well, suppose now you have a, 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 a solution of that same protein that has an unknown concentration. You don't know what its concentration is. Well, you can take that solution and measure its absorbance. So let's suppose that the unknown, so an, an unknown absorbance, I don't know, let's say it's 0 0.5. Let's say that's its absorbance. Well, how do I calculate its concentration? Well, I can plug this value for this absorbance in for A and solve for C, right? So I get that 0 0.5 is equal to 10C plus 0 0.1. So how do I solve for C? Well, I'm first going to subtract 0.1 over to the other side. And I get 0 0.4 is equal to 10C, right? And I'm going to divide by 10. And I also can ultimately get that the concentration is equal to, what's 0.4 divided by 10? Well, it's 0 0.04. And then it'll just have whatever units were the units of the concentration for this curve. So if my units were, say, molar on the curve, <coughs> then this concentration would also have units of molar. Okay? So that's ultimately why you would do this. Now remember, when you measure at A280, 280 nanometers, what you're actually measuring is the absorbance by specifically tryptophan and tyrosine residues. But since they're part of the protein, you can use that to your advantage and actually determine the concentration of the protein. Okay? And it turned out that according to this particular curve, the concentration is 0.04 molar. Now obviously I'm not saying the extinction coefficient is 10, I'm just making these numbers up. But this would be the method that you would go about to do this. Okay, and remember the key for this is absorbance at 280 is used specifically for measuring only proteins. Okay, you don't measure DNA that, that way, that's 260 for DNA. Also, if you're doing any kind of modification to the protein, so say you do a Bradford assay, which is very common, Bradford assay does not do 280. 
A Bradford assay is actually four, excuse me, 595 nanometers. So if you're doing a Bradford assay, you'd have to measure it at 595. But if you're simply taking a protein, diluting it into a cuvette and measuring it, all it is is the protein, no reagents other than that to alter the protein, you're doing it at 280 nanometers, and you would have a curve for doing this. Okay. Now remember, this can be used for um, really any protein, um, except for a few, and what would those be? When could you not use this to quantify proteins? Well, if it didn't have any of these residues, which is actually pretty rare, but there are occasions where you might be dealing with a small peptide. You can do this for small peptides, but if it doesn't have mainly tryptophan or tyrosine, or even phenylalanine, you can't do this for that. So if it doesn't have any aromatic residues, you can't do that. The other thing that would make this technique sort of not valid is if you were trying to identify one protein in a mixture of like a thousand. So basically an impure protein. That's one reason why we do protein purification, which is what we're going to be doing, talking about in a few videos. So if you had a mixture of a thousand proteins, you can do various uh, techniques to purify that protein and potentially only get one of them of interest. And if that one of interest absorbs at 280 nanometers, you can then quantify it. You can generate a Beer's Law plot and you can figure out an equation, a Beer's Law equation that describes that protein and its absorbance to concentration. All right. So hopefully this made a little bit of sense. This is why you measure absorbance at 280 for proteins. Um, I'm Kevin Tokoff. Uh, make sure to like this video, subscribe to the channel for future videos and notifications, and we will talk uh, more about protein purification in uh, future videos. Thanks so much for watching.